think this game showed more than anything how important it is to be able to mix it up in a certain game to match an opposition's threat. Eddie Howe has been often criticised, and criticised by me as well, I'll, I'll include myself in that, for being too consistent with his style. He doesn't really mix it up, it's high press or not, which is why last season I felt like they were exploited a lot with the midfield pressing. If that wasn't quite right, the space between the midfield and the defence grew and grew, and they were easy to play against at points. And the lack of mobility within that back four can get exploited, and, and he maintains the shape. There was lack of any real difference. And Postacoglu, we know how aggressive they are in attack and defence. They attack with numbers high up on the halfway line, and they defend on the halfway line as well. Very high pressing. Well, what you saw in this game was Newcastle adapting, changing their approach while still maintaining some of the qualities of it. They were still aggressive. They were still high press, but slight differences to nullify Spurs' threat. Spurs trying to maintain the same level of quality without the level of quality they have in certain individual areas. Solanke being injured, I know he hasn't really proven that he's at Spurs level yet, but you think with the money he was he was signed for, he is going to be important to how Spurs want to play. And Van der Ven missing out of that defensive line killed him. And and is a, is a, he's got a very Jurgen Klopp like quality in that. Tactically, I don't think he's amazing. And just hear me out when I say that. For example, Jurgen Klopp when they signed Van Dijk, nothing changed about them tactically, but they were a better team because Jurgen Klopp's style needs a certain type of player to elevate that style to get into challenging. Van der Ven does that for this Spurs team. And when he comes out, you see that they are so much easier to play against. That defensive line can get so much more exploited. And as a result, they are so much more vulnerable. This is a system that is individual quality reliant. And when you don't have that in certain areas, the weakness has become really exposed tactically. But enough jibber-jabber. Let's get on to the attacking phase of Newcastle first. Newcastle would build up with their back three. You'd have Byrne in the middle of Kelly and Kraft that would tuck in. Gimmerish and Longstaff in the centre of midfield. Joe Linton pushed up into the left half space. Gordon occupying the right half space. Barnes maintaining width on the left. Livermento maintaining width on the right, but not going up as high. And Spurs, as they do under Andrew, would look to press high. They'd look to be aggressive and win the ball back as quick as possible. That would be Kulisevsky pressing through the centre. Odebear and Son flanking him onto the wide centre-back. Saar and Madison backing him up into the midfield. Basuma staying deep onto the defensive line. And, and the reason for that is, is because... The Newcastle would look to go long often. There was many ways they'd try and beat the Spurs press, and they weren't afraid to go direct by sending the ball back to Pope or getting the ball to either Byrne or Kelly to get a more direct option and go through the middle of the pitch long to Isaac. And the reason that Basuma was kept so close to that defensive line is because Romero was the player that would go to engage Isaac in this in this scenario. And he won the majority of his aerial duels. He was the one that was trusted to go and compete with Isaac aerially. And when he did, Basuma would make little movements to cover him behind and make sure that no space got opened up that Gordon could exploit. Basuma could track that area there. Where they could hurt Spurs was in these wing-back areas. Now, Livermento was a lot deeper, trying to get on the ball deeper and help progress it forward, finding Gordon in the half-spaces. And the half-spaces uh, that were occupied by Joel Linton and Gordon were important for the runs they would make off the ball. And I think the idea was for Livermento to get on the ball here, Gordon could then hit his run in the space between a doggy and Romero for Livermento to fire the ball in. One problem with that was is that a doggy was very quick in pressing him. He was very aggressive, and he didn't really give Livermento a lot of time to turn. And as well, on this side, he's playing with Longstaff. So the easy pass was there. And Longstaff isn't technically amazing to be able to fire that ball into Gordon to, to exploit this area and get on the ball quick. Bruno Gimmerich playing on the other side, we could be looking at a different outcome and a different way of playing because he does have that press-resistant technical quality to get the ball up the field quickly. But Longstaff wasn't really as comfortable doing that. And when he was pressed by Madison, he would often look for the easy option back to then go long again. So they couldn't really progress on that right side where they got a lot more joy was on that left hand side Joel Linton moving into sort of more of a left wing back position to receive the ball in this area of the pitch that was cause issues for Spurs and that was because where a doggy had more freedom to go and press Livermento, Porro did not. It's because of Barnes's high and wide positioning, he was pinned back. So the, then you'd risk Basuma coming over to try and press Joel Linton. The issue is he had a lot more ground to cover. So Joel Linton had a bit more time to pick his passes and pick his moments well. Isaac and Gordon did make a run a few times, but to be fair, Dragerson and Romero defended the central areas really well. But Joel Linton was getting a lot of time in this left-back position to play the ball forward. 
And Joel Linton, with his impressive running power, was able to find the space and run into the half space to receive the ball, which would drag drag us in over into this area that allowed more space in the middle of the park for the likes of Bruno Gimmerich, for the likes of Longstaff to come into this area to receive balls just on the edge of the box, as happened for the first goal. Combination out wide with the underlapping run of, of, of the midfielder creating space on the edge, pulled back, and it was actually Barnes who was in the goal-scoring position, Lloyd Kelly getting forward on the odd occasion to produce the cross, but wide combinations on that side, and with the lack of protection that Spurs got in quick transitions from the midfield and Odebert on that side chasing back, they had a bit of time to pick the passes out, and Newcastle's attack was mostly on the transition in this game. They didn't really have sustained periods of possession throughout it. They were very, very humble in their approach, I think it's fair to say, and, and they caught Spurs lacking a few times. And where they got their second and winning goal in Newcastle was also the quick change of play and transition. And this is where I talked about before, the individuals within this system proven costly for Tottenham. No Van de Ven to be able to manage that defensive line, get back and win his duels in the transition was costly. Jacob Murphy came on for Gordon and attacked that space down the right. Romero was caught sleeping. Then once he'd lost that yard from the start, he didn't have the pace and athleticism and the power to get back in. And Jacob Murphy was able to play it across to Alexander Izak, who scored in an open goal, to make it 2-1. And Spurs were pressing high, and Gordon didn't get those chances to run in between centre-back and full-back. Jacob Murphy did as the game went on, and it's starting to open up a bit. And with that lack of high-line defensive quality, Spurs lost the game, and they only have themselves to blame. Leaving themselves vulnerable without that, they didn't adapt. There was no plan B, and you can't feel sorry for Andrew Postacoglu. It's an issue he kind of brought on himself. So we know how Spurs build up. They didn't really surprise us in any way with the inverted wing backs alongside Basuma, Madison and Saar up into the sort of wide 10 positions. Kulisevsky in the center of the pitch with Odebert and Son. And Kulisevsky is, is the player I'm going to talk about first because when you look at the team sheet, you think, okay, Kulisevsky is going to be playing sort of a false nine role. They're going to try and overload the center and you'll maybe get more of these runs from Son and Odebert. That's maybe why Brennan Johnson didn't, didn't, uh, start because he's not going to make those out to win runs because he, he it doesn't work with that side because he's a right footer. So I thought, okay, that's a way you can hurt Newcastle with a lack of mobility. But they didn't. And Kulisewski played kind of how you would expect Solanke or Son to play. So it didn't feel like he was changing tactically. It just felt like he was putting a worse player in that position for very little reason. I can't quite understand it myself, personally. So Kulisewski didn't play as a false nine. He played as a attacking midfielder slash winger playing a number nine and just wasn't as good so he didn't provide anything really different from these areas of the pitch and Newcastle pressed high pressed man to man then it would be Harvey Barnes and Anthony Gordon coming in from the wings to mark the centre back so Alexander Isaac can drop on Basuma then you get Longstaff on Madison Gimmerish on Saar and Joel Linton pressing up onto Pedro Porro and Livramento pushing up into Adogi and the back three for Newcastle against the front three for Tottenham Hotspur now, as always with Spurs' build-up, there's rotations, there's fluidity, and you would get a doggy moving up into this area here, which would allow Madison to come deep and get on the ball in the left-back position. But Newcastle, they would follow their man wherever they were on the pitch. In the pressing areas, it was complete man-marking. They would get a little bit of time and space on the ball, Spurs, when these movements would happen. So let's say Madison pulling into the left-back zone. If Vicario played that ball over to him, he did have a little bit of time before Longstaff came over to close him down to play it forward, getting Son on the ball, who could then potentially find the underlapping run of a doggy or vice versa, or play it into the middle of the pitch if Basuma could run off of Izak. So there were those moments, but Newcastle did a fantastic job. Physically, they outmatched Spurs. They're better dual winners. They're better in those 50-50s and usually got the better of them once they were more evenly contested. But as always with man-marking systems, all it takes is one player to lose their man and the entire thing kind of falls like a house of cards, which is going to happen. And, and it did happen a few times for Newcastle. One of the ways it did happen was, say, if Romero had the ball here and he played it to Vicario, then Gordon would track the run, losing Romero while trying to keep him in his cover shadow to go and press Vicario on the ball. This would then leave Longstaff in a position of if he comes to Romero, or does he stay with Madison or obviously a doggy in Livermento, vice versa. So... That could get opened up that way. Maybe Saar could come in to form a double pivot with Bruno Gimmerich following suit. 
And those staggering of the positionings of the centre midfielders and Basuma and Saka create quick little passing movements to get them up the field quicker. So there were multiple ways they could play out, but Newcastle did a really good job of battling with them and keeping them contested. But when they would get first back, Newcastle, this is the shape they would operate under. So when Newcastle were forced back, it was in a 5 4 1. Very tight with the midfield four and, and trying to keep vertically compact, leaving as little space in between the lines as possible. But if it was in this situation where Spurs had three between the lines, then you would get Kelly, Byrne and Kraft pressing up onto him to prevent him from getting on the ball in these situations. So it gave more license for Longstaff, Gordon to press up into these areas here to stop the fullbacks getting on the ball and just squeeze higher up the pitch. It gave Isaac more license to press. So they would still be aggressive in these areas, Newcastle. But naturally, the further back you get pinned, the more you give the attack and team time on the ball, the more they have the chance to create openings. And the fluidity was was there again. So as you can see with the central overloads, with the wing-backs inverting alongside Basuma, the wide tens and Kulisevsky up top with the wide players supplying the width. Newcastle's use of the back five was excellent to just try and keep that coverage there and prevent them from getting opened up horizontally. Joel Linton dropping into left wing-back to help. He was fantastic all throughout the game, it has to be said. Just such a quality, well-rounded player. And Spurs did create openings by by creating overloads on this side. So let's just say if, if Kulisevsky and maybe Madison would come into this position as Dragazin was moving the ball forward on this side, then he had options to play through, especially if Pedro Porro maybe pulled out a little bit wider to slip it in behind and into this area through the midfield four, through gaps that opened up. And so Spurs would overload certain sides, but Newcastle were tight, they were compact, they were defensively strong. And as a result, Spurs didn't really get into the box, didn't really create anything clear cut from these central areas. Getting the ball out to the wide areas was tough because they were shut down before they had a chance to do so. Son opened up a few times on the left hand side. Him and Madison, no Adobe, we know how Spurs like to attack with that three on this side. But the work of Gordon covering in and Longstaff sh uh, shutting down that inside channel was fantastic. The only time they would get sort of space in these wide areas was, let's just say, if Madison and Kulisevsky are dropping and Kraft would press up and Byrne would press up, it meant the Livermento and Joel Linton had to maybe be a bit more cautious of the inside and preventing runs from being opened up in this area. So if Spurs could switch the play quickly to Son, he'd have a few more yards that he could attack the box with. But as I was just saying, Newcastle did a very good job of converging on those areas and preventing them from getting exploited and opened up. So really good team play from Newcastle. Uh, in the second half, they did get exploited a little bit more when Spurs had more sustained possession. Brennan Johnson came on on the right-hand side with Kulisevsky moving back into midfield and Joel Linton moved back into midfield to make it a midfield five. And so as a result, there was a lot more horizontal space and Lloyd Kelly was forced out into the left-hand side. And Brennan Johnson was able to attack down the right-hand side and get crosses in, but not enough to really hurt Newcastle and exploit them. And they defended compactly and expertly and deep when they went 2-1 up and they really saw the game out in a professional manner. And Spurs did get a number of shots away, but mostly from range. Hit the bar a couple of times, but a lot of those were ricochets and deflections that you almost can't bank on. And Spurs' goal comes from a shot that Nick Pope really should have saved, really should have held on to. And then Dan Byrne gets his car to sort his feet out to clear it when it's near enough on the on the goal line. So really good performance from Newcastle. Off the ball, on the ball. Very well balanced. And they got the tactics just right. But Spurs, Ange can't just keep hiding behind the fact that they have had injuries. He's got to adapt. And I love Ange. It's hard not to love Ange. But games like this, the lack of plan B, these are the things he's going to get judged on harshly this season. You had the honeymoon phase. It's over now. You're going to get judged as a top Premier League manager at a top Premier League club. And you have to find different ways of getting points in this game. And as much as Van der Ven changes this result potentially, in my personal opinion, because he is that good, you didn't have him. So you had to find a different way of countering the threat of Newcastle. They were always going to have pace on the break. They were always going to look to exploit space between the fullbacks, the bomb on, and the centre backs. And you didn't do well enough to cope with it. But I'd love to know what you guys think. Cheers for watching in a bit.